Yeah, welcome. I think it's time for my start. Uh, my name is Richard Verden. I'm from uh, the sourcing team in Amsterdam. From, uh, and I source mainly logistics, so uh, ocean freight, road transport, uh, air transport. Uh, the reason that I have a uh, uh, presentation today is to talk with you about mega ships. Um, in ocean freight, we get bigger and bigger vessels. And we see that it has a development on the industry and a development on the supply chain, which is uh, an effect of these measurements. Um, so, what I want to, to do now is that I give you a short explanation of what I've seen happening in the market so far, and that we end up with a couple of questions to learn how you see these developments in your company, and with the objective from my side uh, to see how we can help in the upcoming uh, tendering season to um, uh, counter the issues that are coming up. Um, I, I, a few examples we have, for example, in the mega vessels, not every port will be approached with the new vessel. That gives an effect on your supply chain, where do you get uh, ashore and how will you uh, find your final destination? What would be the impact, for example, on your tender set? So, um, I have a few uh, points to discuss first. Let's say, uh, go back into what the current uh, what happened in ocean freight containers and see the market developments, some trends, and then some questions about how to respond to it. History, everybody knows, about 60 years ago, the first uh, container vessel started operation from the US to uh, Alaska. And over years, quickly, more and more uh, containers have been transported. It is uh, the, the top one is the, the first vessel, 55. Uh, 600 containers, currently they go with 20,000 containers in one go. Um, what you see is that uh, as the, the growth over the years was quite constant, but by 2008 there was a disruption in the market, sales dropped, and that also had an effect on the ocean freight carriers. Suddenly they worked with uh, uh, slow steaming, uh, you suddenly had to face a different network already because they wanted to reduce the number of ports they were calling. Um, so, in fact, a new network was coming up at that time, um, but the vessels were, let's say, inefficient for the way they were uh, sailing the oceans. So, in 2011, MERS started with his first larger vessel, which was designed also for the slower steam. Um, but they, they left, let's say, the traditional rules on it, double engine and bigger. Uh, so much bigger that the, the ports could not handle it. Um, and in the beginning, it was going slowly to have the terminals be ready to handle those things. You only in Rotterdam and in Bremen you had some ports who could do it. And in Asia, um, at that time, they also, um, let's say, um, made clear to the market that these vessels would only operate on the Asia to Europe lanes. Um, so that was one development in the, the larger vessels. Um, at the same time, there was a start on the Panama Canal, but also larger vessels were coming up there. The current vessels through the Panama Canal, Asia to US West Coast. Um, no? East Coast is through the Panama Canal with smaller vessels, only four and a half thousand uh, containers. They were normal in '85, so that's about 30 years ago now. Um, and they were, let's say, had an effect also on all the ports in the US on the East Coast. The ports were just able to handle this four and a half thousand, maybe eight thousand vessels, which is not, not larger. Um, but now with the new Panama Canal, there is a step to the 11, 12,000 TU container vessels, which are already, as I just mentioned, already bypassed by the uh, vessels from uh, uh, MERS. Um, so the Panama Canal is limiting the, to the, how you could say, mid sized vessels now, these 12,000. Um, and it will get into operation in probably April next year. And that will 
give space to a lot of these 12,000 TU uh, vessels, which are in operation still on the Asia Europe layer. So what you see is that, especially on the Asia Europe layer, there is a lot of overcapacity of vessels, um, which are waiting till the Palaka opens. And then we will have a, a restructuring of the uh, flow uh, and then the capacities. We have with this mega vessel. This is a flow of, to, to give you an idea about where, where the, the main flows of uh, the containers go. Well, there is a clear trade from Shanghai to, uh, to Rotterdam. There is a, it, we'll be talking always about the, the trade transatlantic. It seems to be a quite big volume. In, no, but in the, uh, strangely enough, you see that there is more container transport in the Asian region than so much on the A, uh, US Europe uh, trade. It's in fact the smaller trade, although this picture does not really make it clear. Um, in containers, that's where it's smaller flow. Uh, and the, the, the the significant one is the one here through the Panama Canal, which is currently smaller because every vessel now calls uh, the East Coast in uh, Los Angeles. Because there they can use the 12,000, 15,000 TU uh, vessels. And as I said, it's just waiting till it opens. And then we get a uh, change also in the US. I can expect it also the, the rail transport, which is a dominant player in the, in the US for transporting the containers to the East Coast, because that's where most of the product is needed. But the rail company will have it quite difficult at the moment the Panama Canal opens, uh, because it will give a shift of the flow. And that's probably why, let's say, half a year ago, there was such a long spark in Los Angeles, because it was the latest moment that they can use the, uh, the strength of the Los Angeles port. Because for the, the coming years, the, the position will be a lot weaker. <coughs> and what do I want to, to show you here quickly is, as I mentioned, the uh, MERS vessel, um, and now followed by MSC and CMA is uh, having them also, um, that they call less ports, and they only can uh, Enter a few ports in um, uh, Asia. You see Singap uh, Singapore, Shanghai, and uh, Hong Kong being the main ports, and in Europe you see Rotterdam, Rema, <coughs> etc. Uh, only one call in uh, the Mediterranean, in other Ziras, if I call this correctly, um, close to Gibraltar, where they uh, make a stop. And you see that there is uh, that it develops to a more uh, hub and spoke network on the uh, ocean. Well, in the past, they were calling every port, and that gives new problems in the ports. In Shanghai, in um, uh, Hong Kong, you see already congestion for the smaller vessels that are reaching the ports. So the large vessels can be handled, terminals are built for it, it's one ship, it comes to the gate and it's known, but there is not enough unloading capacity, unloading capacity for the smaller feeder uh, vessels. And there is a second trend as an effect that we have this reloading and, uh, in these main ports, that the feeder vessels are calling more ports. Um, so you get more sea connections possible, so your, your uh, network the coast can be improved. Um, well, your trend time probably will increase and your cost will be probably about the same because you get the extra handling cost in the ports and the extra uh, transit times for uh, reloading and uh, resale, uh, repositioning the containers. So that, that there will be some changes here in your network which is upcoming. In. You will have new possibilities to think, shall I make a sea connection to a, a port closer to my plant, or shall I use a road transport from one of the main ports to my plant, which is a higher cost. So I expect that the, uh, the, the network, which can be tendered, becomes more complex, and you have more possibilities to uh, make your choices. Um, there is um, 
Now, those are the other points I already mentioned. Maybe the second Suez Canal is important, that it's open, it was developed very quickly. Um, and you see at the end of the Suez Canal, uh, they're building a new port, Siad, to make it larger, to handle also the mega vessels there as uh, a hub to serve the Mediterranean area. But it's not yet in the uh, sailing plan of the larger vessels. Um, as I mentioned, I mentioned already a few points on uh, what's happening in the um, I see negative impacts. I see negative impacts in uh, transit time. I see negative impacts on the congestion. Uh, I see a risk on disruption. Uh, one vessel with delay or with, uh, will have a bigger impact on supply chain uh, in, in the market. And the possibility to respond uh, to problems uh, becomes more difficult. The mega vessels cannot enter every port, they are limited. So if you have one of the main ports having a problem, uh, for instance, this, uh, uh, there is a collision between vessels in the port and uh, the entrance is blocked, these mega vessels have to wait or have to sail to the next port, which can be quite far away. Uh, and there's another effect which is more to the carriers itself. Um, with all this overcapacity and the need to fill these very large vessels, um, carriers are forced to work more together than they want. And you, you see that they, they are trying uh, to, to work together, and you see that um, the antitrust authorities is making checks on it to see that some of the initiatives are stopped already before they actually uh, come to life. But you see a few large uh, alliances uh, showing up now, and the fear is that these alliances, as they sail the same routes, as they use the same network, the similar vessel, that you don't have so many alternatives in your um, tender. You are getting fixed to those parties. Parties, um, and so that, that's a threat, let's say, in your, let's say, in your negotiation power. Um, and I have my doubts if these mega vessels really bring you cost savings in your total supply chain because of the limited number of ports, the extra uh, transit time. You will say, people. Yeah, prices are falling down. Uh, we have big cost reductions on the sea legs. Yes, on the sea leg, prices really went down, but the costs are occurring in other places in your supply chain. And don't believe that the costs are going down as fast as they show, because realize that a lot of the costs are depending on the fuel. You know, the, the, the fuel prices went down sharply. And the carriers still make money. If you look to the, the latest numbers, they made 2% profit over the last year. Well, they are complaining like hell about all the uh, issues they have. But they were able to freeze a lot of the prices in the tendering season, which is December, January, February, while the uh, spot market prices went down the last half year. So it will be very interesting to see what will happen actually in the January, February period, how rates will uh, stay and see if you... Um, okay. there, over the year, there, there, you, you can have the starting to ask yourself, was it wise to have so much uh, in a contract or should I move a little bit more to spot buy? It is a question you, you must ask yourself in your, in your uh, purchasing nowadays, because with such a volatile market, you probably can save yourself some money by uh, having more in the spot market. But tomorrow, let's say in April, when the Panama Canal opens, you can have a, a change in it. So I don't dare to, to put my money on it, really. So it is, it is a company strategy how you want to do it. We're talking about risk in the supply chain. Um, and there is one type of risk we seem to ignore nowadays. We ignore that the sea is also a violent place where things happen. It never reaches the news. Um, but every year, 10,000 containers go overboard. 
And with these mega vessels, it even get bigger. Because in February, the uh, Merck's vessel lost 500 containers in one go. They are stacked on deck on these mega vessels quite high. So losing 500 in one wave is uh, quite significant. And also, these large vessels break, sink, or run ashore. So, when you think in your supply chain and you want to think about alternatives, you have to take in consideration the risks that are also in, uh, in ocean freight transport. Having too much from one uh, vessel is something to consider. And I know there are companies who, for sure, guarantee that although they purchase uh, transport with different carriers, they do want to avoid that there is too large quantity on one vessel only. So they deliberately want to spread it over multiple vessels. And that brings me to a few questions which I have. A few questions which I want to get an understanding on how we should look at them and how we should think about it in our new tendering things. What do we need to do? And maybe uh, somebody has an idea. I find it I like to give a little bit some ideas while I see it. Uh, would you adjust your network to your main ports? Is it the cost driver deciding whether you should adjust or not? It's the trend of times. It is because the trend of times get longer when we have transshipments and you want to get to your old destination. A beautiful example is uh, MSC, who is operating this burst, having now Rotterdam and uh, Flechten and Bremenhaven as ports to call, while the Antwerp port is a very important port for them. So if your MSC is one of your main carriers, you have to think, if I want to get for a lower price, I end up in Rotterdam. And because they cannot deliver for the same price in Antwerp, because then they need to a smaller vessel. So there is an impact on your network. And the question is, how do you approach it? Maybe it's, it's, it's not a question you can answer in one go, but it's something to think about when you prepare your new thing. Or do we uh, come to multiple ports? I think uh, the, the production and the remaining export and production location are not going to change. So mm -hmm. in the end, you're going to look at your total cost to serve, including carriers or Shipment which fear uh, the cost to take into account. But to be honest, I, I don't care that much from which main port it's shipped out. I just look at the total costs mm -hmm. in order to make a decision. Because we're not going to adjust our own network, but we're just going to have to work with the network which is uh, given by the market for transport. Yeah. Your door-to-door -door locations, for sure, you cannot change them. But I, I foresee that you get alternatives. You get the ability to truck from, let's say you have your plant in Aachen. You can truck to, to uh, Rotterdam to connect to the main vessel. Or you go by truck to Antwerp to go on a small. And if you go on a smaller vessel in Antwerp, then is it a short sailing to Rotterdam? Yeah. Uh, with extra transit time, or and so you, you you get more options to consider, and uh, the, the, it will be a cost and a transit time question more than I think in the past, because they can you, you have to think in multiple uh, possibilities in your network. So also I I see that the evaluation of your pricing becomes more complex and also with your your religious planting guys because they they have multiple choices. And maybe they won't multiple choices. I don't know, eh, but some of my customers would like to have multiple choices, others want a very rigid network 
because they say, okay, then there is no doubt, nobody is asking things, they know what to do. For my plan, it's more easy if they know what to do. But then, then we push. Yeah. And it's the, the alternatives can help you with your risk reduction. Uh, because if you think about what happened in China in Tianjin, is it if suddenly a port is out of business for a while and your next port is 600 kilometers away? It has an impact on your supply chain and you have to think how to deal with it. Uh, but maybe you also need to think about do I have in my network already an alternative ready in case something like this happens? Because the disruption on your supply chain is quite huge. And it's, it's not only the origin where these things happen. As I said, vessels collide and a port is also closed for a couple of days. And if your product is critical, you're out of business. And it can be small things. We lately, I think it's reaching the news in the Netherlands when they were lifting up a, a part of a bridge and it falls on the house. The channel is closed for months. So here you go with your alternative of. Uh, I don't know. I'm struggling a little bit. How to, how to go into this new tendering phase? How, to, how to, to put it? Because I'm afraid that if we do all the attempts, it becomes also very complex for the carriers to come up with protection and it becomes more difficult for the innovation. So, I don't know how you see it. Are you in sourcing by then? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, to be honest, I, I would not care whether a product is from Antwerp or Rotterdam. Mm -hmm. And that's, I don't think the complexity of what is important for uh, post transit time and the number of animals which are required. Mm -hmm. These are the things I want to minimize. Um, so that complexity for me is something shipping line is afraid for in between. I don't want to deal with all the complexity, I just want to have all the options. And then based on the, uh, the, the products we want to ship out, we can select the uh, one which shoots a specific order. Yes. Yeah, I, I understand exactly what you say because what I'm trying to come very often in the middle between your position and let's say the carrier. Yeah. Because the carrier feeds all this complexity to us yeah. and I want to format in it in a way that you can make your straightforward decision. And so maybe it's indeed more my problem not to deal with it, but it's yeah, because in the evaluation it, I see that I get more and more complexity in my shoulders too. I think it opens a opportunity for freight for the movement to manage that complexity on the ground for the mm -hmm. That's, I must say, we see that trend already a little bit, that is, um, not every analysis are moving into it and that they get a better position because the ocean freight carriers are uh, limiting the competition between themselves and you, you need to find it in another way. And it's, 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 so straightforward, it might be a direction to go, yes. What I, uh, maybe to, to connect to your uh, um, thread forward, um, we also see that with this reliability in supply chain, we are trying to get a better tracking and tracing of what's happening in, uh, in the container shop to know where they are. And uh, it, it is a tool we, we developed a, a few years ago. It, it is very difficult to get it really accurate because shipping lines are providing a lot of data 
understand what you need is somebody who is cleaning and structuring it and getting the strength things out. And, uh, okay, we, we are now at a good level. Yeah? Clients are satisfied with it, but it was quite different. And you still see that you need multiple sources to make sure that you have this right data available. Because then you can steer your supply chain a better way. And I have been thinking is that something to take into account uh, the, the reliability of a shipping line providing you data, uh, the quality of the shipping line, to build up your awarding in your supply chain. Because in the end, you want to know where your products are. And it's, if, it's, if you have uncertainty, then it creates a lot of cost. It can be still in time, but the uncertainty itself costs already money in your organization. So something like the quality of a carrier and, and, and the data quality we have to is something I think we should integrate in, uh, in the award. So do you, uh, if you offer that tracking and tracing uh, information, do you then also share uh, data quality on carrier? Or is it something you can do yet? I mean, I, I, I see the point that it adds value if you can be very container based and there are probably differences between shipping lines. Uh, is that something that you're able to offer or what you can offer to say this carrier is 80% uh, accurate at the moment? We do it for those companies who, uh, let's say, use these tools because then we can see what they do in their data. I am not so commercial to tell you if we are selling this also to other ones uh, if they are not using this second I leave that to our sales guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they can make a product out of it. In reality, no, we are not because uh, the tracking tracing is mainly on transport of uh, uh, raw materials. So the data are quite confidential. So there is no way we can uh, give information about uh, uh, transport that uh, are late or uh, so we are not uh, transferring this information outside of the users of no, the market. That's not what I'm asking you, what I'm saying is the reliability of the data quality. Mm -hmm. I think what you're saying it could be differentiated to make a decision where they want to work with merge core apps. Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. It is differentiated. But uh, how do I know which carrier provides more accurate information? Now, what we see is that, let's say, the main ports like uh, Singapore, Shanghai, Rotterdam, uh, Los Angeles, their data is good. And as container terminals get more and more automated, especially those ones who deal with the mega vessels, their data quality is jumping up. Because otherwise they never get the container on board. And so, but it is in your feeding, and in, at the moment they have transshipped that you lose accuracy. And I foresee that in this, let's say, this feeding uh, transport, you get more and more companies involved. So with more and more data issues. So it could be that, let's say, the, the quality of data will remain on to these main ports. But if I haven't digged into the data deep enough to tell you that this currently happening. Um, to see our product manager for logistics, um, because I know she's doing a session this afternoon with Nadia. Question. Um, so you mentioned basically the trade-off between the spot buy strategy and the contract that's um, So obviously you want to contract in order to reduce the risk. If the spot market shows opportunity, how can you capture that opportunity without uh, jeopardizing the contracts in place? And what you see is that they're not, you, you have your agreements with your carriers. And you're not, the, the only way to do it is if you deal with, more with your freight forward, that he is actually pushing it on his network. But you know at the moment you've done it once, 
you're losing credibility for the next year, and they remember quite well how you've done it. So it is a short-term win, which and uh, with uh, contracts you always have a period in which you make profit out of it, and the next time you lose money. But you, when you focus on reliability, your your organization is set. And you don't change the quickly. Stick to So basically, you would recommend to stay loyal to uh, carriers because otherwise. It will yeah, the, the next year you will pay the price. Yes, and especially in a market which is so volatile that today prices are falling and tomorrow there is a lack of capacity of pricing jumping up. I expect that this season in Tamil you will see that you get paid for the loyalty of the last year. That's what I see in Megacode. Yeah, I'm still in doubt, honestly, how to, how to, to see these developments now as well. Go. I think we go for a very complex standard this year, and um, we have a difficult period to evaluate everything and structure it in a way that you get a single price with a single service. Uh, I think. Thank you. Thank you.